The title of this presentation is Fundamentals of HRO. It is a presentation portion of the webinar given on May 7, 2020. The Q&A portion of the webinar will be given in a separate video. First things first, where did the term high reliability organization and HRO come from? The answer is a paper that was published in 1989 by Carlene Roberts and Denise Rousseau. They defined a high reliability organization as one that was working in a high risk industry and had an exceptional safety record and that met the eight characteristics that you see here. Examples of organizations that are classified as HRO include air traffic control, nuclear power, and aircraft carriers. And the question that was posed by Roberts and Rousseau was, what can be learned from studying these organizations? More specifically, what do these organizations do to continually operate with little to no catastrophic failures despite having these eight characteristics? Which characteristics would tend to increase the probability that the organization would experience a catastrophic failure? It's a very interesting question, and one that kicked off a stream of research that's been going for the past 30 years. It is important to note here that the term High Reliability Organization, or HRO, is a classifier and not a descriptor. It's not correct to say that we, or my organization, wants to be a High Reliability Organization, because whether or not an organization is in a high-risk industry, and or fully meet these eight characteristics is something that is, not something that is aspired to. A tongue-in-cheek example of this is that wanting to be an HRO is equivalent to wanting to be a nuclear power plant or the like. What one really means to say is that their organization wants to achieve higher levels of organizational safety by mimicking the practices observed in high reliability organizations, which is the basis for HRO theory. The golden question, then, is whether or not this is true in practice for a particular organization. That is, will this work? We postulate that the greater the extent to which an organization or your organization meets the first two of the eight characteristics of an HRO, those being hyper-complexity and tight coupling, the more likely it is that HRO theory will hold in practice. An organization may be described as being complex if it may be represented as a network with numerous nodes and arcs that are highly interconnected. In this network representation of an organization, nodes represent people, machines, and technology, and arcs represent their interrelationships. As a consequence of complexity, the organization may exhibit nonlinear dynamics. That is, a minor disturbance in a part of the organization may bring down the entire organization in ways that are unforeseen or unforeseeable. In addition, the nodes and arcs within the network are constantly adapting and reorganizing themselves in response to external stimuli, and hence the network itself is in a constant state of flux. An organization may be described as being tightly coupled if, for it to function without error, the nodes within the network must exchange large amounts of information with other nodes, act in a coordinated fashion, and are interdependent in many ways. Charles Perrault presented this figure in a book published in 1984 for classifying organizations based on their degree of complexity and coupling. Note that in this figure, the opposite of complex is linear. In addition, note that those organizations that are classified as HRO would sit in the upper right corner of this figure. Let's look at an example of a university that is ranked in the lower middle of the fourth quadrant, which is one that is familiar to myself and the panelists. At a university, the administration, faculty, and students largely work independently of one another. We do not need to coordinate our activities or exchange information on a daily basis to conduct our research and or teach our classes. That is, we are very loosely coupled. A university, however, is somewhat complex, as anyone who works there will tell you. Administrators often say that leading faculty is equivalent to herding cats. While we are largely independent, we all do an array of things that are highly interconnected in the processes of research, teaching, and service. It's difficult to discern the myriad of ways in which nodes and arcs in the network, or in a network representation of a university, are vital to the function of the university as a whole. As you look through these examples, where did your organization fit in? Keep in mind that the figure was published in 1984, and industry has changed considerably since then. 
largely due to advancements in computational power, information availability, and even artificial intelligence. Many believe that today, in 2020, many of the industries depicted on this figure would be shifted up and right into the second quadrant, that is representing tight coupling and in complex interactions. So how does an organization that is complex and tightly coupled achieve organizational safety? Because the organization is complex, it's not possible to know the exact contribution of any one node to the stability of the network, or how a disruption at any one node can lead to the collapse of the entire network due to the nonlinear dynamics within. Further, since the nodes are tightly coupled, these minor disruptions can quickly escalate to full organizational safety events. To answer this question, it is not trivial and is no small task. Essentially, all the nodes and arcs in the network, or stated differently, all parts of the organization, must be functioning as intended to, which is to say reliably, all the time. To do this, the organization must be in a state of constant awareness, where it can sense when something goes wrong and can quickly fix it. For this reason, the practices of an HRO organization are aimed at sense and sense making. That is a recognition and interpretation of deviations from expected functioning, and also at being resilient when these deviations and or disruptions do occur. To help in understanding this, consider the metaphor of the organization as an organism. Organisms, such as humans or ourselves, can sense when something is not right, often subconsciously. And when something is not right, we don't wait to fix the error, but rather our bodies immediately begin the process of repairing the problem, whether it be a virus, a cut finger, or even a strange mood. The same is true of an HRO organization. Their practices are aligned to feel, interpret, and repair anomalies. The observed practices that support sense, sense-making, and resilience in an HRO may be summarized into the seven key practices. The first five are attributed to Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe as per the 2001 book Managing the Unexpected. They refer to these as hallmarks, that is to say managerial hallmarks of an HRO. The first three are related to enhancing the sensing and sense-making capabilities of the organization. And the next two are related to creating resilience within the organization. The final two practices were observed in an HRO by Roberts and Rousseau in their seminal paper. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the meaning of these seven observed HRO practices. The first, a preoccupation with failure, refers to practices that are aimed at enhancing the cognition of individuals within the organization to recognize what, when what they are sensing doesn't match up with the mental model of what they should be sensing. In other words, these are practices that are aimed at increasing the ability of individuals to sense anomalies. The second, a reluctance to simplify interpretations, refers to practices that are aimed at increasing the ability of making sense of what is being sensed. At an individual level, this includes supporting individuals and exploring signals that are being sensed and creating new categories of what the signals might mean. At an organization level, this includes investigating anomalies as being symptoms of an array of underlying causes through scenario trees, Bayesian thinking, or the like. In other words, a reluctance to simplify interpretations is aimed at increasing the sense-making ability of both individuals and the organization as a whole. The third, sensitivity to operations, refers to the practice of holding operations paramount when making business decisions and committing resources to supporting both preoccupation with failure and a reluctance to simplify interpretations within the organization. In general, this practice is about creating an environment that is supportive of both sense and sense making. The fourth, a commitment to resilience, refers to practices that are aimed at ensuring the organization has the capability to be resilient. That is a necessary training, inventory protocols, etc. to repair localized errors that are discovered through the sense-making process. These practices run counter to a wait-and-see approach and instead create a fixed-before-proceeding practice in the organization. 
The fifth, a deference to expertise, refers to practices that are aimed at ensuring that those people who have the most capability of fixing a localized error have the necessary power to do so when they occur. In other words, that the organization has the ability to flip the management hierarchy when localized error is detected, that individuals are able to resolve and fix the error without burdensome bureaucracy in doing so. The sixth, redundancy, refers to practices that are aimed at ensuring a system of checks and balances within the organization. In many ways, this practice combats the effects of organizational drifting into failure as a result of cognitive biases that build up over time and diminish sense and sense-making ability. It's tempting to fall back on the mathematics of reliability, however, and create an illusion that building in redundancy will cover up gaps in sense and sense-making. This illusion might lead an organization to become lax in developing the aforementioned five principles of an HRO, those being the hallmarks observed by Wyke and Sutcliffe, and even make the organization more complex than it already is, which is a point that was argued by Charles Perrault in Normal Accident Theory. This practice of creating redundancy must be done in addition to the sustained efforts in building the previous practices, not instead of those efforts. The seventh, widespread accountability, is the practice of ensuring that individuals within the organization are given responsibility and not micromanaged, and in turn that they are held accountable for their actions while not being unfairly labeled or blamed. The concept of creating a just culture within an organization, as argued by James Reason and widely promoted in healthcare, is an example of practices aimed at developing widespread accountability within an organization. Let's take a look at the relationship between those practices aimed at increasing the sense and sense-making ability of an organization. Specifically, the hallmark of a preoccupation with failure is related to sensing, and that of a reluctance to simplify interpretations is related to sense-making. Note that sensing logically precedes sense-making. When practices within the organization are fostered to increase sense-making, however, this in turn encourages more sensing, which in turn encourages more sense-making. Hence, there is a reinforcing loop created between practices aimed at increasing the sense and sense-making capability of an organization, wherein strengthening one will strengthen the other. The reverse, however, is also true. If HRO practices are not fostered in either one of these, the effect will be a negative reinforcement of the other. The other HRO practices, specifically widespread accountability and sensitivity to operations, are environmental variables whose development will either magnify a positively reinforcing loop between sense and sense making, or whose lack of development will magnify a negative reinforcing loop between these. Similar to the relationship between those HRO practices aimed at sense and sense-making, there are reinforcing relationships between those practices aimed at resilience, wherein increasing or decreasing one will put either positive or negative pressure on the other. The end result of all this is that an organization who seeks to mimic the seven practices of an HRO, they should go about this in a balanced way. That is, foster all seven practices in parallel with equal effort. This will result in positive reinforcements that will largely strengthen the ability of the organization to sense, make sense, and be resilient to anomalies. If done in an unbalanced way, however, bad things may occur. Negative reinforcements from those practices that are not developed will put negative pressure on those practices that are, pushing the organization back to the state where it was before, or even worse. Individuals with organizations that embark on unbalanced HRO programs often feel as if they are put in no-win situations, and even worse are faced with pressure telling them that they should want to win, thereby creating an inescapable double bind. So in a nutshell, an organization that seeks to mimic an HRO should either be all in on developing all seven practices or all out and rather seek other organizational safety strategies, of which we note here there are many, including crew resource management, safety to, etc. What should not be done, however, is to pick and choose amongst those seven practices, as this will likely not increase and may even decrease the level of safety within the organization. 
In conclusion, the key takeaways from this presentation are that first, mimicking the practices of those organizations classified as HRO may increase the safety of some organizations that are not strictly classified as HRO, especially those that are complex and tightly coupled. Second, the practices of an HRO organization support sense, sense-making, and resilience to ensure that all parts of the organization operate as intended to, that is, reliably, all the time. And finally, an HRO program should be balanced across all seven identified key practice areas to be both effective and sustainable. Thank you for your attention. And please contact us at crop at ttu.edu if you have any questions.